My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we have come to another season of the seasons of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his blessing upon us, is that he made seasons of his mercy, opportunities for us to come closer, opportunities for us to do more, to earn that forgiveness. And this has season as it comes to a close is full of lessons. And I'm sure you've already heard many of them. You can go to the stories of Ibrahim السلام, the figure that the Hajj is so focused on, a central component of the Hajj, his story, his sacrifice. You can go to the Hajj actions itself and what's happening and the acts of worship and the rituals that are concluding now. But what I like to do personally every single year for at least one khutbah if not more is to go back to the Hajj of Rasulullah himself for a few minutes experience it with our beloved messenger وسلم, to see what it was like what did he choose to what did he choose to say what did he choose to emphasize in the only hajj that he ever performed and the hadith of Jabir Abdullah tells us that Rasul وسلم, he stayed in Medina he moved to Medina and he stayed there for 10 years without performing hajj the Kaaba was surrounded by idols. The Kaaba was a place of idol worship and evil and debauchery. So it was not befitting to perform this ritual. Until the conquest of Mecca years later, then Mecca was purified and cleansed from these idols. Rasulullah becomes the central figure of authority. And then an announcement is made in the 10th year that Rasulullah will make hajj this year. So he says, as far as the eye can see, people began to flock to Medina. All of them seeking to copy Rasulullah to perform this great ritual with him. And I encourage you to go online now as the Hujjaj is still there. Get on YouTube and search Mecca live. Search Hajj 2023 live and take a look at this great number of people in a ritual that is not mimicked anywhere in the world ever, basking in the worship of their creator. This is what it looked like at that time. So Jabir says, as we exited Medina, as far as the eye can see in front of him were people in Ihram and behind him and on his right and on his left, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the scenario, all of them in unison in their different varieties of wordings, saying, here we are, O oh Allah, at your service. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. And then he says, he came to Mecca and began to perform the Hajj and he told the people, Khudu anni manasikakum. Take from me your rituals. I will show you what to do. I'll explain everything. You don't have to bump around in the dark like civilizations have done for eons looking for the right path. I'll teach you all of it. That's his job, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's his purpose. That's why he was sent. Hajj was no different. And then he also says, as the hadith says in Ibn, of, uh, hadith of Ibn Umar, that in this Hajj, he went around, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa wadda an nas. He said goodbye to people. He said farewell. Fasummiyat hajjatul wada. So it was called the farewell Hajj. And he said, we called it that because of his action, that he went around saying goodbye to people, making a point to tell them, this is it. But we didn't get it, he said, until months later, when he actually passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in this last gathering, in the greatest fashion that it ever happened, that he has never gathered Muslims in this fashion before, nor will he ever again. He made it a point, as he was saying goodbye to them, to repeat this speech three times. On the day of Arafah, on the day of Eid itself, the 10th day, and then in the subsequent days, Ayyam al tashriq on the 11th, 12th, and 13th. To a gathering that he had never seen before, nor will he will see again. Over 100,000 Muslims, over 90% of them, seeing him for the very first and last time in their lives. 
And he chose to say this three times, three different days, to emphasize certain things, to not say goodbye, to not end the conclusion of his mission without telling them, listen to this. And he said a lot of things. But of what he said in that speech, he told them, Ayuhan nas, isma'u minni, ubayinu lakum, fa inni la adri la alli la alqaqum ba'da ami hadha fi mawqifi hadha abada. Pay attention, listen closely, because I am going to make things clear for you. This is important. Not only is it important, not only do you need this clarification, but listen closely because I think after this year is over, we'll never get to do this again. Listen because this is goodbye. This is the end. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for the Sahaba to hear that? For the last 20 years, they've been standing side by side sacrificing time, wealth, blood and sweat to believe that he is Rasulullah to stand by him in battle, in da'wah, in sacrifice, in charity, in heat, in hunger for the sake of this religion. Believing that one day he will be the unequivocal, undisputed leader and everyone will enter Islam in droves and now it finally happens and he tells them, by the way, this is goodbye. This is the end. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الله الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا سورة الفتح was the eulogy of Rasulullah sallam. This is the end. Your mission is over. The people enter Islam in droves. The conquest of Mecca and the Arabian Peninsula is yours. Your deen is supreme. Your mission is fulfilled. The ball is in their court now. The job is theirs as we'll see. And then he told them, أَيُّ يَوْمٍ هَذَا أَيُّ شَهْرٍ أَيُّ بَلَدٍ What day is it today? What month are we in? What land? They could have said Friday. They could have said the day of Arafah. They could have said the day of Eid. They could have said Ayyam al-Tashriq, Dhul Hijjah. Obvious questions with obvious answers, but because they are so obvious, they knew that's not what he wanted. They said, قَدْ يُسَمِّهِ بِغَيْرِ اسْمِهِ Maybe he will change the name. So they stayed quiet waiting to see what he would say. And their level of servitude, their level of submission, of devotion to Rasulullah was so strong that if he said this month is no longer called Dhul Hijjah, this day is no longer called Yawm Arafah, these lands are no longer called Mecca, they would have said done. That's all you need to say. So when he asked them what land are we in, what day is it today, they stayed quiet expecting that and ready to accept it. But that's not what he did. He didn't change the name. It's still Arafah. We're still in Dhul Hijjah. He didn't change the names of the land either. So what was the point of that question? He told them, Inna dima'akum. First he asked them, Is it not the day of Arafah? Is it not the month of Dhul Hijjah? Are these not the sacred lands that you recognize that we just finished performing rituals in? And they said, yes it is. So he told them, Inna dima'akum. وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَعْرَادَكُمْ حَرَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَهْرِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا The point was not to change the name. The point was to tell them a greater lesson. You recognize sacred places and times. We all do. Because when people curse in Ramadan, you tell them, relax, it's Ramadan. You tell them, take it easy, you're in the masjid, you just pray Jum'ah. We recognize the sanctity of times and places and how certain violations are disrespecting not just the rule, but the time and the place. So it's added. He was telling them, you see that? You see how there could be levels of sanctity? You, could, you see how there is red line on top of red line on top of red line in certain times and places? That is the Muslim. He said, your blood and your wealth and your honor is inviolable, sacred between you to each other, the same way that this day is sacred in this month in this land. Picture someone in the midst of these sanctities disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're in a haram, they're standing at Arafah, they're in a holy land, at a holy place, in a holy state, and they don't care. Everyone would say this person's, he's headed straight towards destruction, right? He's diving straight in. Rasulullah is telling us that is the Muslim. And the biggest calamity is for me and you to hear this and say, I'm good. I don't harm any Muslims. I don't kill anyone. I watch my 
I don't take, you know, take from their wealth. But how often do we violate Muslim honor? Backed by our fellow Muslim. And hadith, he told us وسلم, that cursing the Muslim is like physically attacking him. You're right there. It's no different. The Muslim's sentiments inside of them that they don't even express that they feel is sacred to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's time that this ummah starts recognizing that. What if he was here today, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What if you could show him the Muslim ummah? It was only when these sanctities were violated on the inside that they become worthless on the outside. What if he could spend the day with me? Not the community, not my family, not the Muslim ummah. Would he see these sanctities upheld? What would, how would I explain it to him? What would I have to say? He said, أَلَا كُلُّ أَمْرٍ مِنْ أُمُورُ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ تَحْتَ قَدَمِيَّ هَاتَيَّ مَوْضُوعَ وَرِبَ الْجَاهِلِيَّ مَوْضُوعَ وَدَمُ الْجَاهِلِيَّ مَوْضُوعَ of, of the things he spoke to them on that day, he said every single way of life from pre-Islam that clashes with our divine way of life is underneath my two feet today, I'm stepping on it. Things like riba, things like blood feuds, they are no longer befitting for us to live in this way of life. He said, anyone who owes Al-Abbas money from riba, you're free to go. He said that in front of 100,000 people about a man whose entire life business was built on riba, who's his uncle. He just collapsed his business in front of the entire Arabian Peninsula. There are no more blood feuds. And the first blood feud that I cancel is the blood feud of Rabi'ah ibn al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib. His cousin who was a young infant that another tribe had murdered and his tribe had not taken vengeance. He said, no more. Free to go. I am so serious about changing this society. The core rules that are incorrect. I'm so serious and passionate about it that it first applies to my own family. That's what he was saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then there's Muslims today wrenching these things from underneath the feet of Rasulullah to raise them up high over their heads. To take them as ways of life, riba, feuds between people, racism. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on that day, All of you are from Adam, and Adam was from dust. There is no preference for an Arab over a non Arab, or a non Arab over an Arab, black, white, red, and everything in between. O oh mankind, you were created from a single man and a single woman. And the most honorable of you are those who are closest to Allah. He recited upon them that verse. He had these heartfelt messages that he wanted to give out. He told them, Your woman folk, your wives have rights upon you and you have rights upon them. The family only functions when these mutual rights are being distributed properly. The calamities that we hear all this and demand our own rights while being completely oblivious to the rights that we owe others. Forgetting that our own rights, we have the option to forgive. We have the options to take them here. We have the options to be recompensated on their judgment. But for the rights of others, there are no options. We owe them in full or nothing. Of the things that he told them on that day, وسلم, he said, Inna shaytan qad ya'is an yu'bad fi baldikum hadhi. Your shaytan has despaired. He's hopeless of the goal that you, he, he will be worshipped in these lands ever again. The scholar said that means he has despaired in the goal that he strives for the most with other nations, which is to turn them in their totality upon kuf. That will never happen to this nation. Allah will always protect it. The truth will always linger. It will always be apparent. There will always be people who take it seriously. So he has despaired over that goal. But he said, beware, that's not, it's not the end. He is satisfied with everything less than that. Things that you consider no big deal. Watch out, because shaitan will get to work on those. The quality is not enough, so he's going to work on the quantity. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in another hadith, like travelers who stop in the desert, and such and such a person gathers twigs, and so does he, and so does she, and so does the third, and the fourth. And together, they create a giant flame with which they roast their animal. He said, so I said, that's the minor sins, and shaitan's zeroed in on there when he can't get you to do bigger things. Why is shaitan satisfied with that? Because it's enough to destroy you. It's the secondary goal, but it's enough. 
So he's telling you, you beware. You be extra cautious because he's getting to work. Of the things that he told them on that day, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of the many messages that he wanted to share with them. He told them, I have left you with that which if you hold on to, you will never be misguided after me. He began this speech by saying, I won't be here much longer. This is the end. This is goodbye. And then he ended the speech by telling them, you will be perfectly okay. As much as we would have loved to be there, to witness this, to hear it firsthand with Rasulullah in his only hajj. Here we are hearing it over 1400 years later because in that same speech he said, let those who are present relay it to those who are absent. Let them know that you have that which if you were to hold on to, you'd be perfectly okay. The book of Allah and the teachings of his messenger. And he wanted us to know one more thing. This is not for free. This is not a freebie. وَأَنْتُمْ تُسْأَلُونَ عَنِّي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَاذَا أَنْتُمْ قَائِلُونَ And you will be asked about me. You will be questioned regarding all of this on the day of judgment. As you stand for account in front of Allah. So what will you say? They said, نَشْهَدْ أَنَّكَ قَدْ أَدَّيْتْ وَبَلَّغْتْ وَنَصَحْتْ We bear witness that you have relayed the message. You have advised us sincerely and you have fulfilled your role. So he pointed at the heavens and then back at them three times. They said, Allahumma fashhad, Allahumma fashhad, Allahumma fashhad. Oh Allah, be my witness. Oh Allah, be my witness. Oh Allah, be my witness. Over what? That he did his part. And the ball is now in our court. You don't have the luxury of saying, I'm not interested. You don't have the luxury of saying, I can't relay the message. The baton is already in your hands. You have two options to drop it. And Islam ends with you. All of this falls on deaf ears. Or to keep going, to hand it on, bloodied and bruised, dripping, barely any energy in that hand, but it's in your hand still. You held on and it reached the next generation. It followed through. He was so serious about this that in his last moments with the community at large, he wanted to repeat the same words over and over. The sanctity of a Muslim, the rights of your family members, equality amongst Muslims, being wary of shaitan every minute of your life, whether it's summer, whether school's out, whether you're with friends, none of it matters. Always be wary because shaitan's always on the clock. You need to be as well. All of this is not for free. It is a blessing for which you will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment. Did he hand it to you? And what did you do with it? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to instill in our hearts the blessing and the sincerity and the tawfiq to take the words of his messenger seriously and to allow them to allow us to implement them seeking his face subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruhu wa huwa fur rahim. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a lot more in what was famously called khutbat al-wada'a, the farewell sermon. He emphasized, as the scholars have said, the most fundamental concepts of Islam. This speech was a summary of the deepest, most important principles of our deen. In addition to that, he told us that it is something will be taken into account for, that we have to answer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And this mindset changes everything. If you have this mindset, that I have to answer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it, that I will be asked about this man, who was he to you? What of his teachings reached you? What of it did you seek out? That will change my mentality and how I approach it. If I ask myself, Similarly, what if he was here today? Not to observe the ummah, not to observe the catastrophes in our locale, but just with me. To be my personal companion of the day in observing how much of this 
will add up? How much of my life and my personal choices will I have to explain? It, well, it's only temporary. It's only because I got stuck. Well, I'm working on that. Is that what my life would be, my day would be? And I don't have to think about if he was here physically because here's his speech. Here are his teachings. Here's what he wanted me to know. And that should be enough. And lastly, he spoke about the sanctity of Muslim blood. And that cannot be passed over in these times without mentioning the atrocities in Palestine that are continuing against our Muslim brothers and sisters there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them victory over the oppressors. Allahumma ameen. We just passed by July 4th, a very important holiday. A very, very important day for us Muslims. It is the anniversary of the Battle of Hattin in the year 1187. That was the year that, that was the battle in which Salahuddin al-Ayyubi stood up against the Crusaders and was able to defeat them in such an epic fashion that it paved the way for the reconquest of Jerusalem three months later. That was on July 4th, 1187. We passed by that date. We should commemorate it. We should be expecting and building and working towards the next Salahuddin Ayyubi, the next Battle of Hattin. Whether if it's a physical one or that's not the point. The point is the mentality of the Muslim Ummah suffers. The mentality, the communities need Salahuddin Ayyubi. Even if they are not physical generals of an army, they have the mentality that Salahuddin had when he was asked in many of the victories leading up to the final reconquest of Jerusalem. He was asked why you do not celebrate them, why you do not rejoice with your officers. And he said, كَيْفَ أَبْتَسِمُ وَمَسْجِدُ الْأَقْصَى أَسِيرُ How can I smile and the Masjid al-Aqsa is a prisoner of war? So even leading up to it, this was his mentality. So we need more of that more than anything. We need more of that mentality that there is, this is not an option. This isn't something that I'm okay with. This is something that I strive towards and work towards constantly. What can I do then? What can I strive towards? What can I do? Number one, you can call. You can email. You can tweet your local and federal representative. That's easily accessible online, whoever it is in your locale. And whoever it is on the federal level. And then you copy paste. There's so many messages online that you can simply copy and paste. I am not okay with this. I stand against it. And as my representative, I call for you to do the same. So you can request suspension of all material and political aid to the Zionist entity of Israel. They're not going to listen. They may not say, okay, thank you, Muhammad. We'll do that right away. But you did your part. These people represent you legally. So it's your job to tell them, this is not what I represent. This is the least that we can do. At least we spoke out and made our voices heard. Sanctions against the Zionist entity as well, requesting that uh, so long as they continue to commit these war crimes and crimes against humanity. Co as requesting from them to condemn the massacres in Janine specifically that are uh, renewed and ongoing now, as well as the ongoing settler programs and settler expansion in Palestine at large, as well as general awareness amongst your community, amongst your own family, letting them know, why do we care that this is happening? Why is this land special? That these people are fellow Muslims that mean something to us. That we hear all these words about our deen and this camaraderie extends past ethnicity, past blood, past locale. This is the least that we can do amongst other things. Do not forget them in your dua. Do not forget to uh, pledge as much support as you can, whether it be financial or it be emotional. The least we can do is not leave them to stand alone. The least we can do is plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on their behalf to grant them victory. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it so.